and turn to the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. Thank you for the wonder of your word, and thank you how it speaks to our hearts, and I think all the songs today about your deliverance, your encouragement, and certainly the song we just sang, that greater is the one living inside of me than he who is in the world, is going to be portrayed in the pages of scripture today. So let us see your power. We need to in days like this, when not just our church, but so many churches have half or more of the people staying home on Sundays, which to me and the pastors I've talked to is just incredibly discouraging. And we need to return to these truths that it's not even about the church or the people ultimately as much as we may love them, but it's about you. It's not greater is the church living inside of me, but it's greater is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so you're the one who gives us the fuel. You're the one who gives us the power and the peace. And you're the one who gives us your word to proclaim and to hear. So help us to get a hold of your power, to sense your presence in the life of an example of a man who in many ways was like us, had a great passion for you, and yet made many mistakes so we could hook into Peter. Help us to fall more in love with him, but even more importantly, more in love with you today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. In the year 1964, communist Simba rebels besieged the town of Bania in Zaire, Africa. And they seized and executed many citizens. One of them was a pastor named Zebidayu Idu. He was one of their victims. Now they sentenced him to death before a firing squad as they captured him one night and took him to the prison compound. The next morning, he and a large number of prisoners were herded onto a truck and brought to a place for public execution. With no explanation, the man in charge of the prisoners told him to line up, number off one, two, one, two, one, two. The ones were taken out and placed in front of the firing squad. The twos taken back to the prison. Pastor Zebidayu was one of those who was spared. Back in the jail cell, the prisoners and the pastor could hear the sound of gunfire. And the minister took that opportunity to share with those prisoners the message of salvation. And right on the spot, eight of those men gave their lives to Jesus Christ. After he had prayed the prayer for salvation, there came an excited minister to the door with the release order. The pastor had been arrested by mistake and he was free to leave. He said goodbye to the men he just led to Christ, and he ran right to his church. And the church was packed with all of his people on their knees, praying for the pastor's release. When they saw the answer to their prayers walk through the door, a prayer service quickly turned into a praise service. Oh, that is the perfect picture presented to us today in Acts chapter 12. Here we have a pastor like Zebedah who is imprisoned for no apparent reason. Release out of the question. This man is destined to die at dawn. And all of a sudden, a miracle occurs. He's released from the prison bars. And when he returns to the fellowship, what does he find? The whole church praying for his release. And when they discover the answer to their prayers is before them, a prayer service goes into a praise service. What does that teach us? That God can turn any tragic event into a terrific experience in a matter of moments. It's the message I need to tell myself every single day during these incredibly depressing and dark days. God can turn it around. Sometimes it's hard to believe when we see us going forward and then we hear steps that take us backward as we have this, this past week. And we begin to wonder, will it ever change? Will we ever really go forward? But as long as we realize that Christ is in our hearts, when we have the joy and peace of Jesus and we trust him, we could be on our edge waiting for that miracle to happen. 
just as it did in Acts chapter 12. Now, in today's text, in verse 3, we discover Peter is put in the penitentiary. And then miraculously, he hightails it out of the big house. But another apostle is forced to face the firing squad. So just like with Pastor Zebedahu, it's a count off one, two, one, two. And so this brings us to the first point in our outline today. And here it is. Herod devises a pernicious plan. Well, about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Herod is a dynastic title. It's like the president or a king or an emperor. His real name is Agrippa I. His uh, granddaddy was Herod the Great. You recall him in Matthew 2, responsible for executing all the baby boys under the age of two, trying to find the infant Christ. His uncle, Herod Antipas, Mark chapter 6, responsible for beheading John the Baptist. So this Herod has a history of horror going for him. He has, uh, his veins are bubbling up with vicious and vindictive desires. Question, why does he seize leaders of the church? He wants to get in good with the Jews. The Jews are angry. They're angry, first of all, that Judaism is being left behind and Christianity is becoming the new thing. Added to that, injury is added to insult because Gentiles like us are being included. He sees the anger of the religious leaders in the Jews and he wants to match it. He wants to say, I'm on your team and I will prove it. I will knock out the leaders of this new movement called Christianity. Verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. He faces the firing squad. John is the last apostle to die. His brother James is the first. Now you may recall that not too long prior to this, Mark 10, 37, James and John said, Jesus, can you give us the prime positions in your kingdom when you set it up on earth. And Jesus asked the question, are you able to drink the cup I drink from? Can you be baptized with my baptism? Oh yeah, we're able, they said. And Jesus said, you will drink that cup. And James became the first apostle to quaff the cup of death for Christ. His execution, a test case, a trial balloon to see how the Jews would respond. They loved it, so he locks up Peter. Verse 3, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter as well. Simon is put in prison. Comedian Jerry Seinfeld writes, I've never been to jail but I think about jail a lot. I don't know why. I think about how I would fix up my cell, how many push-ups I would do. <laughs> because I live alone anyway, it's kind of the same. I'm in solitary. How could you not think about jail? Every night on TV, we watch people going there. Whenever they're hauling in some criminal terrorist, some psycho mass murderer guy, you notice he's always covering up his face with a newspaper or a jacket. What is this man's reputation? He has to worry about this kind of exposure, damaging his good name. Is he up for a big job promotion down at the office or something? Afraid the boss is going to catch us on TV and say, hey, isn't that Johnson from sales? He was up in the clock tower picking off people one by one. I don't know if that's the kind of man we want heading up the new branch office. Maybe he should be in bill collection. <laughs> Jail is the last place many of us want to go. Jail was the first place... Peter seemed to go again and again and again. He went to jail in chapter 4, chapter 5, and again in chapter 12. And he didn't cover his face with the toga. He was proud to be there. It's just the opposite. 
Could you read for us, Pastor David? Acts chapter 5 and verse 41. That's how he responded after being put in prison prior to this. It was a joy to suffer injustice for Jesus. I like that. Well, the end of verse 3 and verse 4. Now, it was during the days of the unleavened bread, when he seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. Because strict Jews considered it a profane activity to put someone to death during the holy season. Isn't that when they crucified God's son? Of course, they had no choice because prophecy declared he had to be the Passover lamb. So this man thinks he's very religious. Herod says, I'm not going to pollute the season by shedding blood. I'll wait till the festivities are over. We will worship God today. We will waste his spokesman tomorrow. It's the height of hypocrisy. Now, there were four squads of soldiers guarding Peter every four hours. There would be a change of guards, two to watch his side and then two to guard the door. Why would this be true? Because Acts chapter 5 reveals that on a previous occasion... They were put in prison, and then they locked them securely, and the next thing they knew, they were out in the streets preaching about Jesus. And so consequently, Herod said, there will be no Houdini disappearing acts under my watch. I'll put all the soldiers needed to guard Peter and make sure my prized prisoner stays put. And God says from heaven... You want to bet, bozo? And that brings us to point two, and here it is. Peter is delivered from prison, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison. Prayer for him was made, being made fervently by the church of God. Never underestimate the power of prayer. The Puritan preacher Thomas Watson said the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel from heaven. The word fervently, <clears throat> ectene, means to stretch or to strain. So the meaning of the verb suggests there was a lot of energy and a lot of effort and a lot of passion and a lot of power in their prayers. But interestingly, very little faith. We're going to see that later on in the text today. When their Peter is finally freed, they simply don't buy it. But God in his grace says, I will answer your prayer. I have two reasons why God answered this miraculous prayer. Number one, even when our prayers are not filled with faith, he still hears and cares. Some of us don't realize how nuts God is over us. I mean, that's why we have the cross hanging here. That's why we refer to it repeatedly to remind ourselves of God's overwhelming love for us. And he's so anxious just to hear your voice in praise singing to hear your voice in prayers each day, that when you offer prayers to him, he sits, as it were, on the edge of his throne and says, just because I love you, I'm going to give you an answer to your prayer. He hears, he cares, even when our faith is not at a peak level. There's a second reason why God answered this prayer. He has future plans for Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, he's not yet written 1 Peter or 2 Peter. 
the Bible will be incomplete if he dies at this point. He has not given the information to John Mark to write the Gospel of Mark. So Peter cannot die. Half of our churches are afraid of dying. That's where they're staying home. Because health is more important than holiness. As if you think you could save your own life. I think God laughs at that thought. Your day of death has already been designed by God. And there ain't nothing you could do to stop it. When God says to me, this is the day of your death, he could use COVID. And if I protect myself from COVID and say I'm safe, then I could get into my car and instantly be killed in an auto accident. And so if I refuse to get in the car, then I could get a heart attack. I could get a brain aneurysm. I could develop cancer. If he wants to, he could kill me with a lightning stroke. God has so many opportunities. COVID doesn't take anyone's life. God takes lives. If a person dies of COVID, it could have died of anything else. We need to rise above and see God in all of this. So when it's God's design for me to die, I will die. And when my job is not through, COVID can't kill me. An auto accident can't kill me. Nothing can kill the apostle Peter at this point. Not even Herod. I don't care if it brings out 50 swords. Peter is not going to die. Because God has a purpose and a plan for him. Verse 6. On that very night, when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between the two soldiers, bound with two chains, guards in front of the door, watching over the prison. I think Peter was the only one who was a Christian who was sleeping in the whole city that night. We know the church was awake. They were all praying. Peter's not praying. He's not reading the word of God. He's not singing. He's sleeping. He's operating on the principles that he gives us in 1 Peter 2.23. He committed his soul to the God who cared for him. Or how about the great words, the famous statement of 1 Peter 5.7. Peter cast all of his care on him because he cared for Peter. If you're here today or you're listening online and you're thinking, oh, I'd like to have that kind of faith. I'd like not to be afraid of dying. I, I, I wish I was like Peter. I wish I was a man or woman of faith. Peter did not just happen to be a man of faith. He used to be like you. He used to be a man of fear. You can grow into faith. You could learn to exercise those spiritual muscles. We know that Peter, in his past association with the Savior, was a man known for anxiety. Yes, it took a lot of faith in Matthew 14, 30 to step out of the boat and walk on water. But what happened when he exercised one step of faith? He saw the waves. Had he been a surfer, he would have been okay. But he's a fisherman, so he's not okay. And he became afraid. And what happens when you're afraid? You go under. I have heard that some of the greatest numbers two weeks ago, 60% of the increase of those who died of COVID were those who obeyed the orders and stayed home and locked themselves down and got it from a family member. Fear will take you down. Remember what Job said when we studied Job? That which I have anyone feared the most has come upon me. You've got to crucify your fears. Peter had a hard time. He was afraid of the waves. Matthew 17, 24. He was worried. Oh, Jesus, tax day is coming. We don't have money for taxes. Jesus said, give me a fish. He reached inside. Here's the money. Take it to Caesar. No problem. 
John 13, 24, he's worried at the Last Supper. Lord, oh, oy vey, who is going to betray you? And then, of course, we know he's also worried in Matthew 16, worried because Jesus is talking about crucifixion. Stop it, Lord. I don't want to hear that cross talk at the table. <laughs> but here we are in Acts chapter 12. He's destined to die. A sword's going to hit his head. It's going to, his, his head, like James, will be rolling down the streets of Jerusalem. And he's asleep. Here's a question to consider. Here's a question to take with you the rest of the day and the rest of your life. If you know for certain that tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., you're going to lose your life. Would you sleep like a baby tonight? Good question. See, I'm a worry ward. I can't help it. It's just my nature. No, that used to be your nature. That was the old nature. Read Romans chapter 6 and 7. You've been given a brand new nature. And your new nature is not to worry. It's not to live in fear. It's to live in faith. It's to trust God for the impossible. And we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we are to walk by faith, not by what we see. The world is walking by sight. The world this morning has no faith. Negative 10 faith. Forget zero. It's below sea level. They're looking to us. This is why it saddens me that churches, and I don't know what churches are doing across the world or across America, but I know what churches are doing in Orange County. Churches in Orange County are being a bad testimony of faith and trust in God. The world needs us, and we're failing the world. They need to see this place filled. They need to see our lives filled with joy, filled with happiness. I'm not talking about being foolish and walking up to some stranger saying, can I have a bite of your hamburger? We're not talking about that. Use common sense, but also exhibit some courage. God asks us to be courageous. Peter is courageous in the fact that he puts his head on the pillow and falls asleep. I love that. Why would he do that? Because Peter knew something that the church didn't know. Pastor Dave, would you turn back to John? John chapter 21. And listen as Jesus speaks to Peter in John 21, verses 18 and 19. The stretching out of the hands representing the crucifixion that he experienced years later in Rome. But the critical phrase, when you are old. It's been less than 10 years since Jesus spoke those words. Peter is about midlife, if not even less. He's not old. So he figures everything's going to be fine. Here's how we reason. God has more in store, so tonight I snore. <sighs> He's out like a light. Someone once asked Warren Buffett, now that you've become the richest man of the country, what's your next goal? He said to be the oldest man of the country. And Peter said, I'm going to be the oldest of all. I'm not going to die tonight. I will sleep by faith tonight. Verse 7. Behold an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and the light shone in the cell. He struck Peter's side. 
woke him up saying, get up quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. That's where we get the title of today's message, Peter was touched by an angel. Actually, it's not true. Peter was struck by an angel. The Greek word, patasso, means to hit as if a punch. He didn't whisper, Simon, would you like to get up and get out of here? Peter, let's go. And he hits him. Today, our son Matthew is turning 26. When he was in grade school and junior high school, every other Wednesday was late start, which simply meant if he wanted to go surfing, he could on those Wednesdays. But he had to get up really early before dawn. So on every other Wednesday, I would walk into his room at about 5 o'clock, pitch black, and I would not whisper, Daddy? Would you like to surf with daddy today? He would say, no, thank you, and go back to sleep. I walk in, snap on the light. Matthew, get up. Okay, get your board. He's grabbing his board and his wetsuit. He has no idea what he's doing, but he's moving. And that's exactly the picture we have with Peter. He is on the move. The angel jacks him around, and he just takes off. It's amazing. He looks down, chains have disappeared. Wow, am I dreaming? Verse 8. Angel said to him, gird yourself, put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel wakes him. The angel doesn't dress him. Don't miss that. He says, follow me. Not I'll pick you up, little Peter, and carry you outside. There's a lesson here. God won't do for us what we could do for ourselves. If you're out of work and you're praying and asking God to give you a job, good luck with that one. God says, I'm not giving you a job. I gave you a brain. I will lead you to the right job. You get your job. You want God to change something in your personality, a sin that you don't like? You say, God, just change this. He's not going to change that. God will not do for you or for me what you and I can do for ourselves. We need to own up to that. The renowned evangelist, D.L. Moody, the great man of faith, was pastoring a church in Chicago in the 1800s when a deacon stood up at the beginning of the service and said to the large congregation, we have a ministry in our church that's in need of $5,000. I'd like us to petition the congregation in prayer asking God for the money. Pastor Moody stood up and said, why bother God with that need? Pass around the offering plate. In 10 minutes, the $5,000 came in. I like that. Peter could not pull off a jailbreak, but he could pull up his toga, couldn't he? He could put on his sandals, and he could start walking. Verses 9 to 10. He went out, continued to follow. He did not know that what he was being done by the angel was real. He thinks it's the twilight zone. He thought he's seeing a vision. When they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. They went out, went along one street, and immediately the angel disappeared. Focus on that little phrase, opened by itself. It's the Greek word, atumate. Doesn't take much common sense to figure out what word we get from that in English, does it? Automatic. Automatic. The door opened as Peter and the angel walked through the iron gate, triggering its action as if passing through an electronic eye beam. Heaven's eye beam opened that gate. Heaven's eye beam could open the gate that keeps you in your prison of fear today. But like Peter, you got to get off your duff and you got to show up to church and you got to show up to ministry and you got to show up to smile at those who are frowning in the world today. 
and God will automatically open those gates for you. But first, he needs to see you step out in faith. He needs to see that from me as well. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, I like that. It's like he woke up and realized, hey, now I know what's going on. Now I know for sure the Lord has sent forth his angel, rescued me from the hand of Herod, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting, which was his execution. So Peter is delivered from prison, and then we discover, number three, that the people are dedicated to prayer, verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. This was the principal meeting house for believers in the city. I wish we had someone in our church who had a house this big. We could be saving a whole lot of money every single month. We know this house held at least 120 people because that's where they gathered at this house in the upper room waiting for Pentecost. John, we don't know anything about his daddy, but his mother and John owned this house. John, of course, is the one who was the manuensis that Peter dictated the gospel to. We are told in history, uh, John Mark later founded a church in Alexandria, Egypt. And then eventually, because of his belief in Christ, was drugged to death in the city streets by a team of wild horses. Verses 13 to 16. Peter knocked at the door of the gate. A servant girl named Rhoda came out to answer. She recognized Peter's voice because of her joy. She didn't even open the gate. She ran in and announced, Peter is standing at the front gate. They said, you are out of your mind. No, 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 he is there. They kept saying, it's just his angel. But Peter continued knocking. Oh, the faith of the early church. You paint the picture? Rhoda bursts into the sanctified prayer meeting. Low murmur, oh Lord, we love our pastor. Please protect Peter. Please save him. Rhoda says, you don't have to pray anymore. He's outside. Shh. You're interrupting the prayer meeting. <laughs> oh Lord, save Peter. Bring him miraculously out of prison. I'm telling you, he's at the door. Someone give her a Valium. Slow her down. They did not believe the eyesight evidence and the knocking evidence. They prayed. They didn't believe God would answer their prayer. Unlike the little boy who did believe in prayer, but did not believe in being good. And so one Saturday morning, he got in a little bit of trouble. And his parents said, we're sorry, son, but because of your activity today, you will not be going with us on a picnic. He wasn't too bothered by it. He was quiet, maintained a good attitude. So his parents thought, let's give in. I mean, he's, he, he didn't throw a temper tantrum. So an hour later, his dad walked in. He said, son, we've changed our mind. You could go with us in the picnic. That's when he began to cry. His dad said, what is wrong? You could go to the picnic. He said, it's too late. I've already prayed for rain. <laughs> That is faith. When you pray, do you believe that God's going to answer your prayer? Sometimes the answer to our prayers is standing right before us. Peter is standing right before them. And like the early church, we choose not to listen, not to look, not to believe. Christian dad prayed ceaselessly that his prayer uh, would be for his son's emotional difficulties that were just seeming to strangle his life. And he couldn't understand why his son was so depressed and so distraught. He kept praying and praying. And one day he voiced a concern to a friend in the church. And the friend gave him an answer that he did not want to hear. He said, unless you're willing to spend time with your son, all your prayers will miss the mark. You are the answer 
to your prayer. Your son doesn't need your prayers. He needs you. The father refused to listen. He kept talking to God. Nothing changed. There are times in which prayer is fruitless and wasteful if we're not willing to listen when God answers. When you're through praying, here's what God would tell you. Open your eyes. You're praying for Peter? Go outside and look for Peter. He might just be there. Peter is pounding on the door. They're praying on their knees. Peter is pounding on the door, and they're praying on their knees. And he's quitting and a ruckus. He's going to get rearrested. It's getting scary. Come on now. Come on. It's time to open up and believe. Well, verses 16 and 17. When they open the door, whoa. I can't believe it. God answered our prayer. They were amazed. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led them out of prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. That would not be James, his brother who died. Or actually, yeah, uh, James, that's right. But this is the other James, the brother of Jesus who wrote the epistle of James. And then he left and went to another place. No, nobody knows where Peter vanished to. He just vaporizes from the scene. He pops up one more time in Acts 15 for a brief moment, and then he's gone. We don't find him anymore in Acts because a brand new personality occupies the place of prominence. And who's that? The Apostle Paul. And he'll start dominating the scene all the way to Acts 28 and beyond. And as we've said before, if you want super simple outlines, that best biblical and simple outline for the book of Acts is this. Acts chapters 1 to 12, Peter. Acts chapters 13 to 28, Paul. That's it. It's Peter and Paul all driven by the Spirit of God. So Herod thinks he's going to pull a major power play by putting Peter in prison. Now he looks like a first class fool. And that's point four. Excuse me, I don't know what we missed point four. I don't have that up. Here it is. The potentate is dumbfounded over Peter. Write that down. The potentate is dumbfounded over Peter. He doesn't know what to do about this. Verses 18 and 19. Now when the day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. So when Herod searched for him, he had not found him. He examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. And then he went down from Judea to Caesarea, that's next Sunday, and was spending some time there. Well, it was the annual baseball game between the townspeople and the inmates at the local prison. When the chief and biggest hitter on the prison team came to the plate, he reached back and swung with all of his might and hit a vicious ball way over the fence, way out in the field, and he began to round the bases. The prisoner rounded the first base, the second base, the third base, and he headed for home. And they finally caught him between the third base and the Mexican border. (laughs) We thought he's playing baseball. He's running for the border. We thought Peter's in prison. He's out walking in the streets. What a shock to Herod. Simon has skedaddled. So Herod grilled the guards. The jailer had no idea what's going on. And so in Roman law, if the man that you are responsible escapes, you must pay his penalty. So the guards are executed instead. But the Lord's servant miraculously set free. An Indian named Sadhu Sundar Singh was an evangelist in India and in Asia for some time. He tells about preaching in Tibet and offending the chief lama because he proclaimed something different than the Hindu religion. He talked about Christianity. He talked about grace and forgiveness. And the lama was so infuriated at the evangelist's message, he actually tossed him into a pit down a well and then sealed it with a great cover 
and locked it and left the evangelist to die. And when the fall down the well, he severely injured his right arm. And as he fell down the wall, he was hitting the bones and the rotting flesh of other people who had died in that well. Give me the heebie-jeebies. Stuck amongst death for days. And boy, did he pray. Oh, God, get me out of this death pit. Day after day after day, on the third night, the door of the well suddenly opened and a rope was lowered with a loop in it. He was able to take his good arm and his good leg into the loop. He held on and he was pulled up to the top. When he got to the top of the well, he looked. There was no one holding the rope and it was attached to nothing. So we went out to the city streets the next morning and he kept preaching about Jesus. (laughs) The llama was furious. I want to know who opened the well. A subsequent investigation revealed the only key to the lid of the well was locked under the belt of the llama himself. Sounds like an angelic escape to me. Brings us to the refreshing reminder, and here it is. Say it together. God puts a hedge of protection around his holy people. He certainly does. He chooses oftentimes to safeguard his saints. I remember talking to a lady from our congregation who told me that her and her mother had been broadsided by a semi-truck. Completely squished the car, demolished beyond recognition. They miraculously climbed out of the car without one single scratch. There was a man I led to Christ some time ago who told me that before he became a Christian, he was on the freeway one afternoon and a car switched lanes and passed by him at over 100 miles an hour. He said, Pastor, he missed me by less than six inches. Coincidence? Or providence? Because God knew that man was going to come to Christ. God puts a hedge of protection around his holy people. A number of years ago, I was traveling down Harbor Boulevard to go surfing, and I was driving in the left lane near the center divider. And suddenly one of those huge cement trucks come down. Don't you love those trucks? They ruin your paint. They, they, they pit everything in your car because they're kicking things up. So here he comes with a double trailer just barreling at 55 miles an hour straight down Harbor Boulevard. He's in the right lane. I'm in the left lane. And all of a sudden he decides he's going to come over to my lane. The problem is I'm in his blind spot. He can't see me. So he's moving over. I'm honking the horn. He's not paying any attention. And I realized in about four seconds, I'm a dead man. So I had a quick prayer. Lord, save me. And then I floored it, and I aimed for the center divider, and I hit the divider, literally went airborne, and ended up going 55 miles an hour against traffic on Harbor Boulevard. I figured I had a better chance going there than staying there. Miraculously. God stopped all the traffic. I was allowed to make a U-turn and go back and drive to the beach. God puts a hedge of protection around his holy people. Let's bow together. I wonder, Father, if we won't get to heaven someday and pull back the curtain to discover how many moments you supernaturally saved us from what seemed to be a certain death. The truth is our lives are no less miraculous than Peter's. But maybe we find ourselves, especially at times like this, complaining about perfunctory things and failing to give you praise for what matters the most. We need to see through the lens of faith. Open our eyes 
to watch the miraculous. Teach us to be appreciative for every moment that we've been given, even a single breath of life. God wants to offer you more than a breath of life. He wants to give you the gift of eternal life. Life that begins right now and life that is never ending. It's a wonderful relationship that is initiated when you respond to the call of Christ for your heart. You willing to do that today? You willing to recognize that, like everyone else, you have failed and fumbled and faltered and sinned, and you need God's Son to save you from your sin. And right now, you want Him to become your Savior and Lord. You could offer a prayer that He will hear because He cares for you, a prayer that could absolutely alter time and eternity. If you want to pray that prayer with me and give your life to Christ today, I'd ask that you'd raise your hand good and high, and I will see that hand, and I will pray with you. Father, I want to thank you for, for a brother who raised his hand. He knows you, and he wants to see his faith strengthened in you. He wants to be able to see past sad circumstances that I know surround him today. Give him hope. Fuel him with happiness. Help him to know in his heart that you could open the doors that prevent his release automatically. And I pray that these next few days that he will see some, some miracles in his life. Grant him that grace by means of the prayer that he's offering in his heart before you today. Thank you for what you've taught us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You're welcome, buddy.